Philippians 4 and 17. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. This is part two of a message we began last week. And I want you to help me before you take your seat. Look at somebody and say, it's not about the money. Amen. Go ahead and take your seat. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to review what we shared, that is, review much of what we shared on last week. If you missed it, I encourage you, please, you can view, vis, uh, review the service, the message uh, online. Go to our YouTube uh, channel. Uh, go to our website, and you can get the archive, and it, it can bless you um, because there's much that I said on last week that I just don't have the time to share, uh, but it's connected. And furthermore, I want to say this. If you missed last week, then you didn't hear this. And um, you didn't hear me um, speak of my record, my consistency, and that of this house. We don't talk about money all the time. You know, I just felt my flesh right rise up. It's like I want to come down and slap people. Like, is that the best you could do? If I were here, I'd be like, <clears throat> he must be lying with that response. The only time we talk about money is if I'm doing a special series, like now, and during our offering time. Am I correct? <laughs> Why are you saying that? I'm saying that so that you do not make the mistake of judging me for the subject matter today. There's a reason why I'm teaching, and we explained that on last week in light of some things that have been said and gone viral. I want us, and as your pastor, to have an understanding. And so I felt it necessary to address some things, okay? And so with that in mind, uh, let's continue. Let's pick up where we left off last week. We talked about that which has become a controversial um, topic uh, in Christendom today, in the world, in the church today. Controversial today, but not controversial in antiquity or in times past. And so uh, it brings us to this point in the message or in the series, and I'll need at least another week, um, given what was going on today and with our acknowledgments of graduates, I knew that I had limited time. So let me just delve into what I'm going to say. And when it's all said and done next week, there will be a connection and you'll see uh, wh 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 where I end, why what I shared previous to my conclusions on next week had to be said. And so uh, there was this statement about the validity or the legitimacy of uh, giving in the church today and especially regarding tithing. And note, it's tithe, not tied. You wash with tide. Okay? Tithe is simply a word that means tenth. Everybody say tenth. The tithe is a tenth of one's increase or income. Leviticus 27 and 30 says, And all of the tithe of the Lord, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is whose? It's the Lord's. And it's holy to the Lord, set apart to the Lord. As I said on last week, this is a good place to uh, remind you that when we talk about the tithe uh, and it belonging to the Lord, understand that the 90% left over, tell your neighbor that belongs to the Lord as well. Mm -hmm. So in actuality, 100% of what you call my money really is God's money. We, we, we shared a little bit of that on last week. Should have got your shout in earlier, y'all. Gave you, gave you some preaching time so you could dance, okay? So, um, so um, all of it belongs to the Lord. Remember, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the silver and the gold. The Lord says, Haggai 2 and 8 belongs to me. We shared that on last week. Tithing essentially is a base. It's a, it's a, it's a starting point and is viewed as such. Offerings, offerings. Everybody say offerings. Uh, tithe is a specific amount, the tenth part, and the offering, and it's the tenth part, the first 10 part, 
tenth, the first tenth, not what you have left over. It's time for us to stop giving God leftovers and give him what's first. The tithe is that which is extra, anything extra that you give um, beyond uh, tithe. Uh, there is this talk of tithe and the Old Testament law, and that's where some of the contention arises from because it is presumed that the tithe is simply of the law or something that was a part of the law. Tithes were basically mandated, given, and designated for three uses. The Levitical or sacrificial tithe, Numbers 18, verses 21 and 24, for those of you who are taking notes. Then there is the festival tithe, Deuteronomy 14, verses 22 and 27. And then there was the poor or charity tithe. Uh, that would, was uh, that part of the tithe was used uh, for uh, benevolence. Deuteronomy 14, verses 28 and 29. Many old school uh, theologians um, would argue that these are not necessarily three separate tithes, but three separate or three uses of the one. And so there are these objections that you hear or arguments with regards to tithing. Let me pause before I deal with the objections to say that um, in this hour, as we shared a few moments ago in giving, what we should be doing is excelling in giving, not looking for ways to decrease our giving to the Lord, our serving of the Lord. There's some folk that um, don't take them too long to develop new habits. And some folk who were very much involved in church ministry have allowed a virus to stop you from coming to the church house, but you going everywhere else. How do you know? Because you're posting it. I'm seeing your pictures. I'm seeing you at the concerts. I'm seeing you at the theater. I'm seeing you on the airplane. In crowds that are much larger than... We should be excelling in all things. Uh, so I want to just address some of the obje objections today. There is the objection of tithing being exclusively linked to the law. Hence, as we shared on last week, the argument that is presented using, um, um, using the, the texts uh, in Romans 6 and 14, for we are not under the law, but under the grace. And so with that understanding or with that argument, then we should not do anything that is under the law because we are under the grace of God. And so we dealt with that on last week. And of course, um, um, there, 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 there are people who have espoused this um, hyper or extreme grace um, uh, teaching, and uh, that's then how they live their life, and, they, and they, they think that it's a license for them to do whatever they desire to do, even if it's sin, I'm under grace. And so, as the text goes, pastor, brother pastor, I read the Bible and study too. Where grace does abound, or sin does abound, grace does much more abound. And so, yes, Paul did say that. So since where sin abounds, grace does much more abound, let's sin more so that we can experience more of God's grace. Come on, everybody, say hallelujah, glory to God. No, keep reading. Paul said, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, certainly not. No, 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 no. How shall we who are dead to sin live any longer therein? How many of you, let's be honest, okay, just by a show of hands, don't call out what it was, but how many of you will agree this past week since I saw you last, you were tempted to do or say something that wasn't right? Some of you falling into temptation right now. You're lying in the house of the Lord. You a bad somebody because you know I'm telling the truth. I didn't say you acted on the temptation, but all of us have been tempted Mm -hmm. But thanks be to God who will not allow us to be tempted above what we are able and will with every temptation make a way for our escape. Some of you are on your way out to get into some mess and the phone rang. Your grandmother, baby, what you doing? 
Sit down, I need to talk to you for a minute. Uh, um, grandma, Grandma, sit down. I'm your grandmother. That's right. Sit down. I got to talk to you. And by the time she finished talking with you, you was tired, didn't want to go out. <laughs> the fact of the matter is tithing predates the law. It was not introduced in the law. Tithing was, however, incorporated into the law. Now, those who would contend with what I, or, or who, would, who would contend against what I'm saying, who would be in conflict with what, what I'm saying, they will cite Abraham giving tithe to Melchizedek. Yeah, they will do that, but then they will move on. But the fact of the matter is, Abraham did give tithe to Melchizedek. Let's look at this in Genesis chapter 14. Genesis chapter 14, verses 18 through 20. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, that is Abram, gave tithe of all. He gave tithe of all. His tithe here was the spoils of battle. This was 430 years or so before the law that Abraham gave a tithe or a tenth. Moreover, we see in verse 22 of Genesis 14, Abraham acknowledged God's sovereignty by the tithe and by telling the king of S Sodom, I li have lift up my hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth. And uh, he wanted it to be clear that what I have received has come from the Lord, so you'll not even have a moment to think that I'm rich because you made me rich. This was the Lord's doing that gave me victory, that graced my life, that blessed me by his grace. And so I want to give to Melchizedek, who just appears on the scene. We'll say a little bit more about Melchizedek, and we'll see his placement uh, in the New Testament scriptures. Keep moving. Genesis chapter 28, we see the occasion of Jacob. Y'all remember Jacob? Jacob arose, verse um, Verse 18 of Genesis 28, Jacob arose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put at his head, set it up as a pillar, and poured oil on it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of the city had been Luz or Luz previously. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and keep me this way that I am going and give me bread to eat, and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth, a tithe to you. This was all before the law, okay? So keep that in mind, and we'll see again that the uh, law did incorporate the system or the practice of, uh, of tithing. Here's another objection that I hear in the arguments. Well, uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, ob objection regarding tithing as being only produce and livestock. That is, grain, wheat, uh, cows, goats. Um, please note that uh, <laughs> uh, Abraham gave tithe, remember, Abraham gave tithe of spoils. There, 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 there was like a bunch of things in the spoils, whatever had value. And, and there, was, there was silver and gold among the spoils of those that God gave him victory over. Um, ancient Israel was an agrarian society. And therefore, they gave tithes of produce of the, of the land, of the ground, and they gave a tithe of livestock. Now, we are not an agrarian society. We have farms, and I love to see farms. I'd like to be on a farm um, but, and then go back home. Okay, 
Um, I like to see the animals and, and all of that. When I was a kid, um, we, my mom would take us down to her grandparents in, in Mount Holly, Holly, New Jersey, and they had a farm, and we s enjoyed seeing the chickens and the, and, the, and the cows and whatever else he had, and it was wonderful. And believe it or not, growing up in Rawway, our neighbor, uh, it was a dear, a, a dear man, his name was Mr. Gardner. And Mr. Gardner, this is right here in Rawway, y'all, Mr. Gardner, Sandy, had a farm right next door to where I grew up. He had chickens, and that chicken would make its noise. What's, what's with the hen, right? No, not the hen, the rooster. See how much I know about farming. That thing would be loud, wake you up in the morning. But he had um, some pigs, and, and, and he had uh, produce as well. My parents had uh, a, a large garden in their yard growing up. Our neighbor had uh, larger gardens than we did. So I grew up around these kind of things. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I think I was so skinny growing up, because I really wasn't much of a vegetable eater. And I didn't like squash. Didn't like egg, yes, didn't like egg. In fact, I don't like it today unless it's just blanched or steamed. I didn't like eggplant. I know I've been told, oh, it tastes just like meat. I don't know where, I don't know what kind of meat you've been tasting. It, it don't taste like chicken, don't taste like beef, don't taste like pork chops. <clears throat> okay, I'm better now, but back then it was like, oh Lord, my God, and squash, it was just like everything in it, squash and peppers and onions and some of y'all mm, ah. <laughs> mm -mm. um, note that even though they gave a produce and livestock look at Ver uh, De Deuteronomy chapter 14 verse 24 and 25 uh, selling produce to convert the value to money was permitted but if the journey is too long for you so that you are not able to carry the tithe or if the place where the Lord your God chooses to put his name is too far from you when the, um, when the Lord God has blessed you, then you shall exchange it for money, take the money in your hand, and go to the place which the Lord, your God, chooses. Here's another objection. I'm just going to hit it and run, okay? Um, here's the objection of what's called New Testament silence. So it is presumed and argued, well, the New Testament doesn't teach on tithing. Um, the early Christian church did not need to talk about tithing, probably because it was not an issue for them. It was already their practice, and not simply, again, according to law, but a practice, a precedent, a principle before the law. Um, there is um, an era of, uh, you will get into danger zone when you construct doctrines based on silence or the absence of men mention. Um, this is not throwing any shade. It is what it is. When I was a freshman in college, um, there was a, a, a strong presence of uh, the Church of Christ denomination. And um, one of my roommate, um, we had a mutual friend, and uh, he was a part of the Church of Christ, uh, the organization or the denomination Church of Christ, and, um, and the non-Pentecostal one, mind you. And um, uh, he invited me to come to the service. And I went to the service, and what immediately struck me as different was that none of what you see here behind me, drums, organ, piano, there was not one in the house. And it wasn't because they couldn't afford instruments. It's because they didn't believe in instruments. They did not believe that you should have instruments in the church because the New Testament doesn't speak of instruments in the church. And furthermore, they felt like instruments compete with the congregation's ability to sing and be heard. And I thought even then, now isn't that strange? And then it dawned on me, that's their conviction, that's their practice to this day. Why would the New Testament have to talk about instruments when you see the theme is prominent in the Old Testament? Praise the Lord with the timbrel and dance. Praise the Lord with the, 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 the stringed instruments. David, the sweet psalmist of Israel, not only played a harp and played instruments, David 
the Lord gave sounds to David that uh, he didn't even have an instrument to produce. So God gave him the ability to create instruments just so he could produce the sound that he was hearing. And with the advancement of time and technology, you know, we don't have a harp only because I don't have a harpist. Every now and again, we'll have a harp. And it's one of the most beautiful sounds. I'm, I'm amazed when I see somebody playing the harp. So the point is, just because the New Testament, as you uh, interpret it, is silent on instruments in the church, don't mean having instruments in the church is wrong. Brother Rodney over here is our eldest uh, team member, and uh, he plays, he, he, he's, uh, you know, they didn't put it out on, everybody already know about how old you're going to be. What are you, you're like, like 60, 70. <laughs> See, I was going low. 70. Yeah, y'all give it up for him. Come on. And, and he, he plays those instruments as he did when he was a teenager. And he told me that when he was playing the congos at, at early on, that it was not received well in churches. In fact, I think if I recall, you said that some churches wouldn't even let you come in and play the congos because they thought it was worldly. But I'm glad that he did not listen to them, that he did not allow somebody whose tradition uh, did not agree with him playing the congos, that he was still able to release his gift, and um, that Rodney's music is known around the world. Uh, that we sang a song as kids, and, and never did I know, never did I imagine, rather, at the time, that as we were singing Stop By by Benny Cummins in the King's Temple Choir from Long Island, that I would meet the guy who was killing the Congos on that song. There's a break in there. You can find it now on YouTube or Apple Music. I'm glad that he did not allow somebody's tradition to dissuade him or deter him from what God has given him, and he has mentored many people, even from afar, by staying true to what God has given to him. Be careful of the silence um, perspective. Um, John Wesley correctly said it this way, that as Christians, we must consider the whole tenor of the Scripture. I'm hearing just a little feedback. Um, team. Uh, here's the next one I want to deal with today, and that is the objection citing the Jerusalem Council. They use this one to say that uh, Acts chapter 15, I encourage you to read the entire passage, and when you do so, you will see that it doesn't have anything to do with tithing. Specifically, it's not addressing tithing. What it's specifically addressing is the matter of circumcision. Circumcision and um, the Mosaic law. And so there were believers Gentile believers who were being told by some of the Jewish believers that you cannot truly be a part of the community of faith of the household of God except men that you are circumcised in the flesh, that you bear the mark of the old covenant. And so this word got to the apostles and to the elders, and they came together and was what is referred to as the Council of Jerusalem to address the matter. And uh, Peter speaks up. And if you'll recall, Peter was told of the Lord, do not call unclean what I have cleansed. And Paul was sent to the house of Cornelius, a Gentile, to preach the gospel. And while he was preaching, the Holy Ghost fell upon those Gentiles, and they received the Holy Spirit. Peter says, as we did at the beginning, that is, as recorded in Acts chapter 2, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. And so uh, they addressed the matter, and they said, uh, uh, by, by virtue of, of a letter that was sent ahead of them, and then they followed up to go to the Gentiles, and they said this in verse 24 of uh, Acts chapter 15 through 29. We have heard this, that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we're sending Judas and, 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 and Silas to confirm the word of, by, by word of mouth what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, 
from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from, for those of you who had no problem with the first few, and sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Now, it's interesting to me, if you go back to last week, the hypo grace or extreme grace thing says anything that's of performance is work, and that's legalism. But here the apostles are saying, no, you ain't got to be circumcision. That, in fact, is circumcised. That, in fact, is legalism. Your salvation doesn't come in circumcision in the flesh. That simply pointed to something of a spiritual matter and that those who are born again are circumcised in the heart. We bear the mark of the covenant now. It's a spiritual thing. But he doesn't say that you have a license to do whatever you want to do. He said there are some things that you should not do. You should abstain from the very appearance of evil, and you should live your life as unto the Lord. So a lot of folk who are trying to get out of giving, be it tithe and offering, they ain't trying to get out of sexual immorality. They're trying to find out more ways they can drop it like it's hot. Oh, my time is up. <laughs> Let's look at Matthew chapter 23. Here's a, a, a something that I want to share. Um, not so much as an objection, but people will say, well, Jesus never talked about tithing. Well, yes, he did. Matthew 23 and in 23, he says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. He goes on to say, these you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. He was in fact commending or endorsing tithing, not recalling it, he could have took and taken the opportunity at this moment to say, you've been doing that, but after I die on the cross, you don't have to do that anymore. But he's saying, no, nah, y'all going through, you're giving your tithe, you're giving your money, but you're acting like hellions. You act like you don't, you, you don't even notice God that, that you say that, 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 that you're so connected to by covenant. He says, no, give your tithe, but don't neglect the weightier matters. You got folk, they'll, they'll give money and be hating on people. They'll give money but refuse to give a helping hand. Oh, Lord. The Greek word ought in the English Standard Version is a strong word. Um, it, you'll see its presentation in the uh, English uh, English Standard Version is that it is a strong word and it indicates of necessity. So one could translate the verse this way, you must do these things and you must not neglect those things. Just as recent as this morning, I heard somebody sharing on the same topic, excuse me, of which I'm sharing with you today, and they said, um, yeah, okay, well, okay, well, that's just one time Jesus talked about tithing. Well, Jesus only said once, you must be born again. Did he just have to keep repeating it over and over and over again? Okay, let me wrap it up for today. Um, I want you to consider Melchizedek again, okay? And I want you to go this time, not to Genesis, I want you to go to Hebrews. Hebrews. You know that book, Hebrews rather than Shebrews, which is the reason why men should be making coffee and not women. Husbands, make your wives coffee. And of course, that's not accurate, okay? Look at um, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Do you all see that? Okay, just a few of you see it, right? It's on the screen. They can't see it. Okay, Hebrews chapter 7. Um, we'll see Melchizedek again in verse 1. He's the king of Sa Salem. He's the prince, priest rather, of the most high God who Abram, Abraham met, returning from the slaughter of the, uh, of the kings and blessed him. 
to whom also Abraham gave the tenth part of all, being first translated uh, king of righteousness, Melchizedek his name, meaning king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, which means king of peace, okay? Uh, Melchizedek uh, is considered a type of Jesus Christ, okay? Uh, uh, he, uh, you'll see it even more so. Um, uh, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, type of the Lord Jesus Christ, pointing to Jesus Christ, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was to whom the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the, of the spoils. And then he goes on to say, and indeed those who are the sons of Levi who received the priesthood have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law. We mentioned earlier the Levitical type. That is from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithe from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Look at verse 8. Here, more, and, and Hebrews is, 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 is written sometime after Jesus had passed away. And for those who would contend that Paul never said anything about tithing, uh, there is a strong argument, though the author is not actually identified, there is a very strong uh, argument that scholars believe that Hebrews was in fact written by the Apostle Paul. And so, whoever the writer is, we find here in verse 8, here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them, of whom it is witness that he lives. Mm -hmm. It's talking about Jesus Christ. So I know you, you, you gave your, your gifts, your tithe, your offering, and you might have giving it through push pay or giving it in an envelope and uh, you in fact have given it to the Lord that's how he sees it he's received it from you as you've given it according to uh, how the Lord has blessed you my time is up and I need to finish this on that next week because I can't have them trucks out there too long and the ice cream melt so join me standing Next week, I'm going to bring it to conclusion. At least that's my attempt. That's what I plan for. That's what I have here in my notes. But I want to share you. I needed to share these things first. And uh, uh, I need to, to remind you of this. If you've observed me through the years, you'll know that we are very consistent. I don't use the hellfire and brimstone approach. Uh, if you don't want to do it, that's on you. I know for me, I delight in giving to the Lord. I really do. I delight in giving to the Lord. I've been, I've been given to the Lord 40 plus years, 40 plus years I've been given to the Lord because that uh, dear mother over there, um, you got your check, but it had to go through her hands first. And she taught us about giving to the Lord first, even when I just had a little bit to give. I know what it is, I know what it's like to be down to my last dollar and to give it with a smile. And, ex and, and give it as a seed and watch God turn that one dollar into two thousand dollars within a 24-hour period some of you've heard my testimony before I've watched God I've watched God um, in the lives of others that as they trusted God and they that they gave not under compulsion because Paul does deal with that and we'll deal with that next week as it relates to giving nobody's holding a gun to your head um, in fact, that'd be the only way somebody would get money out of some of you is, and God forbid that would ever happen. Um, that's, that's not a giving that delights in the Lord that you don't want to, I mean, he gave it to you and he's just, he's just asking for a tenth, a tenth. What is, what is tenth? The tithe, what is the tithe? The tenth, right? All right. Uh, think about this. Think about a dollar in your hand, a one dollar bill. I know you'd rather have a hundred dollar bill, but what is one tenth of that dollar? It's a dime. It's 10 cents. It's 10 cents on a dollar. Bishop Jakes preached a message a few years ago. Uh, uh, turn it on a dime. Turn it on a dime. And that the, the blessing that's released in giving, and specifically his message was regarding tithing. But 
tithing and offerings. Um, God has given to us the privilege of partnering with him in giving, not because God's trying to meet a budget in heaven, that God's a little short this week, that God wants to make your life miserable, that he wants to take from you. No, it's not about the money. And we'll say more next week. It's not getting money from you. It's getting money to you. It's getting blessings to you. And so ever since I got the revelation of it, I give with a smile on my face. I give. May not always feel good about it because I'm challenged or been challenged as you might be, but I've trusted God and I've watched God. Wow. I watched him blow my mind. And so, whether you change your view or not, I'm going to still keep giving unto God the way I've been doing and looking for ways that I can excel even more because it's been working for me. It's been working for me. Amen. I am grateful. And for those of you, because I, I feel it in the house, uh, see, if you, if you just learn in me, then uh, listen. <laughs> Um, please know, uh, even those closest to me, they can tell you when, when God shows them something, you can ask Annette. <laughs> Not telling you to, to gamble, but if you're going to put your money on it, you better know when I hear from God, I hear from God. When I see something, um, when I hear something and I say it, I know what I mean. Um, uh, there, there are some of you that, 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 that you're so very, very judgmental because you have the wrong view. You think that whenever the preacher is talking about giving, you're giving to line his or her pockets. And that's just not the case. I'm amazed what I've been able to do um, <laughs> over the years, um, being able to stretch resources, just like you've had to stretch resources. I think I said this on last week. I know what it's like to be frugal. I know what it is to be thrifty. In fact, uh, most times I look way more expensive than what I might have on. You might just think this, that, and the other, but I, pr I pr promise me, I'm th I know how to find a bargain, y'all. I have been anointed to find good deals. I, I walked in the vitamin shop yesterday and grabbed something, didn't even see the sign, and went, and the man said, you know, this is buy one and get another half off. Excuse me. Because it's something that I take regularly. So I find bargains. All right? And then furthermore, cut me some slack. If I wanna, if I wanna do like, like um, Lauren, Jermaine, if I, want to do, if I want to do like some of those and wear some nice kicks, I don't gamble, I don't smoke, I don't drink. I, 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 don't, I don't do those things. I'm not clubbing, I'm not drinking. No, I know there's some preachers out there that's doing all of that, but I don't do that, okay? I just, I just, I just don't. So cut me some slack if I want to spend a little something on me. Right. Father, you know our hearts. You see all things. I'm simply taking the time. It's a teaching moment. Share with your people. It's my endeavor always to rightly divide the word of truth. I pray against confusion. I pray our questions be answered. I pray it be settled in our heart, Father, that we will worship you with all that we have and all that we are, recognizing that we are who we are. <laughs> we, we are what we are by the grace of God. And so may we excel in all things to your glory and honor, not neglecting even the things that are weightier. I pray that we not be those people Jesus spoke of, just religious folk, hypocrites as he called them, 
but that we would honor you in all things and that this house would always be one of integrity, that we will give having been blessed, we will give making an impact in our community, in our nation, and also in the nations of the world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm just um, reminded of, of this, just for example, this week. Um, this is something that we do often, but just this week, um, we, we sent $7,500 to um, Kenya um, to assist with the orphanage there that we helped establish. Um, just, just this week, that's just one, 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 one thing um, that we did. We can only do that be, because of, of the manner in which you have blessed, blessed us. And uh, uh, I, just, I just found out uh, something um, the other day that I, I just got really excited about um, of some funds that I wasn't even aware of um, that, uh, <laughs> that we can use for a, a particular project of advancing the kingdom of God. Um, this is not it for us. This is just where we are at this point. If you're here for the first time, if you're a guest here, I want you to look around to the glory of God and imagine beyond these walls, everything you see above us, below us, the property, everything you see has long been paid for. Agape is debt free. What you saw even in leading in giving is not j something different today. It's something that is done this way every time. You don't see me with the $100 line, the $2,000 line, and if you're in the $2,000 line, I'm gonna give you a longer prophecy than those who are in the $100 line. You don't see that. We haven't had chicken dinners and fish fries. We don't have pew rallies. We, d we don't do all of those things, but God has blessed us because we have taught people in giving, not using manip manipulation, but the purity of God's word. And where God guides, he provides. Where there's vision, there's provision. And I'm amazed by God's grace and blessings upon this house. We have been blessed and continue to be a blessing and will be a blessing. Thank you for your um, excitement about that. Uh, <laughs> I know you didn't think I was finished. Before we head out, if you're here today and you're not certain, if you're not certain or sure that all is right with you and the Lord, you can be certain. Let me say this, God loves you way more than I could possibly say. God's love for you is perfect. There's no flaw in his love. His love is not to be compared to human love, which requires you do something in order for me to love you. His love is unconditional. It's not um, based upon conditions that you have to meet. His love for you has always been, before you were ever in the mind of your parents, God's love was extended for you. And because of love, God gave. He gave his best, Jesus the Christ, who came to bring salvation to everyone, including you. I want everybody just to bow your heads for a moment. I want you to close your eyes and not look around. Let's just honor this moment. For those of you who would like to receive Christ, you want me to pray for you. You want to be born again. You want to be a child of God. You want to be a part of his family. You want to be a covenant child of God and receive the blessings that come to his children. I want to pray for you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I simply want you to identify yourself. If you want me to include you in this prayer, I want you to just slip up your hand high enough for me to acknowledge, see it and acknowledge it, and then you can put it down. I see your hand. God bless you. There's the dear one. I see your hand. Young man, God bless you. Is there? God bless you, sir. Is there another? Is there another? I see your hand in the rear beneath the flag. Some of you are viewing online. I can't see your hand, but, but God sees it. God sees you right where you are. Church, would you help me to pray with these? Let's all just lift our hands before our God. And I want to lead you in prayer. Just mean it from your heart so that you're not just reciting that which is meaningless. Make it meaningful. Believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, even as we pray, and confess him as Lord. That's what I'm going to lead you in doing in prayer, and, and, and my family is going to help, all right? Let's pray. Dear God, I repent of my sins. I turn from this world, and I come to you in leave. Jesus is risen from the dead, and with my mouth, I confess Jesus is Lord. 
Lord Jesus, save me, deliver me, and fill me with your spirit. I give my life to you, and I vow this day to live for you all of my days for your praise, for your good pleasure, and for your glory. Thank you, Father, for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Come on, church. Angels in heaven are rejoicing. Let's do the same. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you for watching. I trust that you were blessed by the message. And if indeed you were, would you do me a favor? Do all of us a favor. And I say thank you in advance. Take a moment right now and subscribe to our channel and share. And if in fact the message has blessed you, would you partner with us by sowing a kind and generous seed? Your partnership with us helps us to do what we do in spreading this gospel, good news of the kingdom to people everywhere. Thank you in advance and join us again next time.